The Thursday, October 19th meeting of 2010 of the Cape Cod Commission is now called to order. And I'll ask the clerk if he would kindly call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Barnstable? Present. Bourne? Present. Brewster? Present. Chatham? Present. Dennis? Present. Eastham? Here. Falvin? Here. Harwich? Here. Mashkey? Orleans? Present. Provincetown? Sandwich? Present. Truro? Present. Wellfleet? Here. Yarmouth? Here. County Commissioner Representative? <coughs> Minority Representative? Here. Native American Representative? And Governor's Appointee? Here. Mr. Chairman, it appears we have four. Thank you very much. The next thing on the agenda is public comment. This will be public comment for items that are not on the agenda. I must say I'm quite unaccustomed to not having public comment when the words are said. <laughs> However, we'll go on next to the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to update the commission members on several things that we've got going. Uh, the Our Ocean DCPC Policy Committee uh, met for the second time last week. And uh, as we get into the September-October time frame, the technical advisory committees will be taking over that discussion and producing work products. So in an October time frame, we expect the policy committee will uh, reconvene stakeholder committee probably in the same time frame and review the work product that's been produced uh, there. So we, we look forward to making some progress uh, over the next 60 days on that plan in a substantive way. Uh, additionally, our regional wastewater management plan is ready to be rolled out. So we are going to take uh, a unique step in how we present that to the public meeting on a watershed by watershed basis. So we've identi identified eight priority watersheds. Those meetings will start on September 23rd. Uh, so look forward to more information on that. Additionally, we have three federal grants that commission staff is currently engaged in working on right now. One is a Tiger II transportation uh, grant that will look at the canal area and study the canal area, including um, what to do with the bridges, uh, which is a big question I think that was highlighted uh, last year when, when they had to deal with the construction efforts over there. We have uh, had a canal area study on, on our work plan for quite some time, uh, but we've brought the town of Bourne, the Regional Transit Agency together with the Army Corps of Engineers. And so we, we hope that our, if our grant's successful, we'll be able to look comprehensively at the future of that uh, canal crossing um, within the next year. Uh, additionally, there are two other HUD grants out there. One is the Sustainable Communities HUD grant that we are working on right now that has a wastewater focus that would provide more capacity to look at uh, potential regional efforts to support the wastewater solutions and discussions that are underway on the Cape. And I think that's a, a, a really necessary grant, uh, especially as some of the communities come forward uh, and are starting to grapple with the uh, enormous numbers associated with some of these cleanup efforts. Uh, the third grant is a challenge grant that is really more of a transit-oriented development grant. Uh, we are partnering with the Town of Barnstable and the Regional Transit Authority on that grant, um, looking at the RTA in Hyannis and that transportation hub and how we, how we might uh, uh, plan for better transit-oriented development around that area. And the town of Barnesville is actually the lead on that grant, and uh, we're supporting their effort uh, with the regional transit uh, agency. Uh, so the, that's sort of an update. Uh, the final thing I would like to say is, is I keep reading in the paper about our um, work with NSTAR and the rights of way. And uh, we've already tried to clarify some of the misinformation with a letter to the editor, uh, but I think another effort is probably called for here. I keep reading that somehow the commission is complicit with NSTAR and poisoning the, uh, <laughs> the water supplies. And uh, uh, you know, just to set the record straight, we've done a lot of work with NSTAR, with the state, and with the federal EPA on the plan that's going forward out there. And uh, a lot of the work is, is mapping the areas, getting the best data sets available so we can be smart about how we're going to go out there when we get the boots on the ground and the GPS units. Uh, that will be happening 
towards uh, the middle of September. So we'll be out there. And I can, I can say that this commission has exercised the full extent of its jurisdiction in this area to make sure that uh, no drinking water supplies are contaminated. And uh, we've, we've uh, worked with the state, with NSTAR, and with federal EPA in order to do that. Um, it is not within our jurisdiction to ban herbicide applications. And even if that were given to us, it would force us to look comprehensively at all herbicides, whether it's what you put on your lawn, what uh, farmers use in the course of agriculture, what the National Seashore might be using, what some of our municipalities might be using, what we're using at airports to, to, uh, to de-ice planes. Uh, it has to be, in order to be legally justifiable, that we, that we look comprehensively at, at all of these potential uh, toxins and chemicals. Uh, there are certain groups uh, that don't want to do that on the Cape. Um, they just want to sort of look at this one NSTAR issue. Uh, so we are working diligently on that. I'm convinced uh, that when we get to the end of this, we will have a well monitoring program sponsored by the State Agricultural Resources, NSTAR, and the Cape Cod Commission uh, to look at especially the Outer Cape areas that we, we are working with EPA right now so that not only the state but the Federal Environmental Protection Agency will provide, provide joint verification of any program that goes forward, and we will absolutely have the most detailed and the most accurate information for the location of private drinking water supplies uh, in the state. Uh, so with a, with a high degree of confidence, this commission has done everything within its power to protect the drinking water supply uh, on the Cape. And to hear some of the rhetoric that's been passed around um, is definitely uh, disappointing but uh, you know it's a political year and there are races out there and people are going to say what they're going to say in order to get people's attention but I in my conversation with uh, region one yesterday it's clear what our jurisdiction is and that we've exercised uh, everything that we have the ability to do to date here on the county level and the regional level it's clear that EPA is limited in what they can do that the real sort of jurisdiction here lies with the state and if the ability to ban these substances is, is uh, necessary, and I personally think it probably should be an option that the towns have or the region have to meet certain criteria to ban herbicides, that re requires a change in state law. And so it is with the state, with the, with the Agricultural Resources Department, that that responsibility lies. And uh, that's been clear to everybody from the beginning. Uh, so I just want to make it clear uh, the efforts that the commission has undertaken to protect those drinking water supplies and to and at the end of this process to finish with a work product that I believe will be a best management practice and a national model. Uh, and that if you hearing anything other than that, uh, I, I would really encourage people to sort of check the facts. So I just want to make, make that clarification and uh, know that we will be following up in a very public way to make sure that the, that the public knows the facts associated with the work that the commission is under, has undertaken and uh, how vigilant we are about protecting drinking water supplies on uh, the Cape. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. I have a question, if I could, regarding the Bourne uh, application for the grant. I was just wondering whether that includes MacArthur Boulevard. Uh, we, ha we haven't finished the final scope, um, but the focus actually will be on uh, capacity issues on the bridges and some of the ancillary roadways and the ancillary roadways that feed on uh, over the canal. The ones that are of particular concern are the round ones. Uh, so uh, they have already been marked up for um, review. So uh, there are north side rotaries that need to be looked at. There are also south side rotaries. Um, maybe down as far as the Otis Rotary, which would include some review of MacArthur I'm not, Boulevard. I'm not trying to be facetious, but that road is connected to getting off Cape. And uh, all, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. Uh, they're all connected to something else. But, but, but uh, even in the meantime, uh, I think maybe we could make a suggestion to the town of Bourne how they could fix it up without spending a lot of money. 
Well, it's a state roadway, so I don't, Bourne's not going to spend any money on it. All right, uh, I'll, I'll be <laughs> but, quiet. But the but it's a good point. We have had very productive discussions with the town of Bourne lately, so you'll be, we'll be see more work product coming from Bourne. We're actually going to send the reset team there in in uh, September. There's been a lot of work done in the Buzzards Bay area with Stantec and other plans yeah. and the National Marine Life Center and other proposed developments there and you're going to see a growth incentive zone application come through and other developments on the north side. Uh, so we've had some very productive discussions with the town about focusing on the north side right now. Uh, some of those MacArthur Boulevard issues involve transportation improvements, public safety improvements and then some land use planning that has to happen around there. So okay. we have begun those discussions but I would expect more immediate action on the north side than on the south side. Does anybody have a question? Please. Joanne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I liked your report. Um, you did a very good job. Um, where Sandwich is a contiguous town, I'd like to know if there's a way that um, Sandwich can be included. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that Sandwich is also on the other side of the bridge. They think, you know, but um, it certainly is all the way down Phillips Road. And um, you know, Sandwich um, has great, gained great momentum in trying to be inclusive, and um, and I'm sure you will be including us. But I didn't know if there was a way that specifically we could be included. Or yes, and the, the list I gave earlier was a partial list. There were more people at the meeting, and certainly the Upper Cape Chamber uh, was represented there. But um, we have had some preliminary conversations with Bud. We need to follow up more with with uh, Bud uh, and the town of Sandwich and the administrator and, and the assistant administrator there because of the importance of that Sagamore landing uh, and some of the sort of transportation improvements that uh, might be suggested there. So we absolutely will do that, Joanne. May, may I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Say it again, please. Can I, can I say something else? Uh, yes, brief. Briefly. Yes. Um, and, and that's good. And I know you were before the SEIC and maybe that yes. they could be included. I also wanted to add to uh, what you were talking about um, pesticides. Um, MassPrig had a, uh, a huge incentive and awareness and filing a petition in order to stop using pesticides in the United States that Canada does not. And I think that probably putting the emphasis on uh, not, you know, not pointing fingers, but to genuinely do something about not using pesticides decides that harm our environment is probably a, um, a place where they should be focusing. Thank well, you. It, it, that's, and that's what we've been trying to do. I just want to make the point that I, we need to make clear is that the Commission and NSTAR are following the laws as written. And that if we want those laws changed, if we have more comprehensive action, that that change has to come from the state legislature through the governor. Are there any other comments anybody wants to make at this time? All right, on to the first item of the agenda. Uh, we have a public hearing, regional policy plan proposed amendment to the energy section. Uh, this public hearing was continued from August 5th until today. And our staff person is Ryan Christenberry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Ryan Christenberry. I'm a commission planner. Um, the energy amendments that are before you today really fall into uh, two categories. There are some technical revisions uh, that with the permission, the permission of the chair, I thought we could walk through first before we get into the proposed amendments for um, wind energy conversion facilities. In your packets that you received um, by mail, as well as today, I've uh, included it twice because I thought it would be easiest for us to walk through the changes this way. Um, it's a three-page sheet that includes redlined track changes. In the top left hand of the corner, it says energy with an E in parentheses. It's the proposed um, technical revisions and track changes in ordinance format. There are five of them that I thought we could just walk through um, and make sure there are no questions before I get into the wind performance standards. Uh, the first under minimum performance standards is uh, that E1.1 through E1.5, that should be E1.6. We had some numbering um, issues there. The second change is in energy performance standard E1.2 designated is a um, nonsensical typo. It should be designed to earn the Energy Star. 
and then the next section should be designed as well to earn the Energy Star. And then on the next page, uh, MPS E1.6 should be MPS E1.7. And along those lines, the alternative method for meeting MPS E1.1 through E1.5 should be E1.6. So those are the, that's the extent of the non-substantive changes um, on the technical side. And I would just suggest that at the end, a motion to carry forward all of the changes, if, if you see fit, would be appropriate. As for the uh, minimum performance standards that we're uh, proposing, with respect to wind energy conversion facilities, there are three of them. Let's see. Sorry. Thank you, Heather. Um, so the question for why we're proposing these standards at this time uh, is fairly straightforward. We're beginning to see some large wind proposals across the Cape that are meeting existing DRI thresholds, and we don't have sufficient performance standards to review the projects. Um, the Cape Cod Mall was the first that came through with a proposal for wind turbines, followed by um, a proposal that I believe, if it's not before you yet, it will be soon, a uh, new generation of wind development in Bourne, that again, these projects have triggered uh, DRI review through existing thresholds, and staff felt that there needed to be some sort of um, performance standard on the books to review projects specific to wind, specifically um, potential impacts with noise, safety concerns, or shadow flicker issues. We're, the standards that are, uh, that's fine. Um, the standards as proposed are here. I believe you received them in a packet. Um, again, there are three. The first is with respect to safety. And if you'd like, I can just read through the standards as they are. MPS 1 for safety reads, all wind energy conversion facilities shall maintain a clear area of one and a half times the tip height of the wind energy conversion facility from any structure outside the applicant's development site. Applicants may negotiate a reduced setback with the abutting property owner provided that the reduction would not pose a threat to life or property and provided a waiver is obtained in a form that is recordable in the Barnesville County Registry of Deeds if the DRI is approved. Any waiver shall reserve rights to tort and nuisance claims. A schedule of operation and maintenance and decommissioning procedures shall be provided with the application and shall be made part of any decision. Guidance can be found in Technical Bulletin 10.002. MPS 2 for noise, all applicants for wind energy conversion facilities equal to or greater than one megawatt shall provide a noise study to be verified by a consultant hired by the Cape Cod Commission to adequately mitigate, no mitigate adverse noise impacts to residential uses outside the applicant's development site. Guidance on noise study components can be found in Technical Bulletin 10-002. MPS 3 for shadow flicker, all wind energy conversion facilities equal to or greater than one megawatt shall demonstrate there are no adverse shadow flicker impacts to neighboring or adjacent residential uses. Guidance on shadow flicker components can be found in Technical Bulletin 10-002. The Planning Committee met this past Monday to review these standards. Next slide, please. And the proposed changes that uh, I believe you've received in your packet today are before you here on the screen. Um, it's they're, they're minor changes. The first would revise the safety standard, and it would read, all wind energy conversion facilities shall maintain a clear area of one and a half times the tip height from the base of the wind energy conversion facility to any structure outside the applicant's development site. The second change the planning committee discussed was for clarification about who pays for the noise study. Um, and that change would read all applicants for wind energy conversion facilities equal to or greater than one megawatt shall provide a noise study to be verified by a consultant hired by the Cape Cod Commission and paid for by the applicant to adequately mitigate adverse noise impacts. So those are the standards that are before you. Let's see, next slide. I kept my presentation brief, um, knowing that there'd probably be questions and and uh, need for public comment. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Do, does the commission have any questions of uh, 
our staff person. Yes, please, Elizabeth. Are there more uh, wind energy conversion facility regulations that you're working on, or is this finish it up? Uh, this is it for at this time. This is all we're proposing at this time. Okay, whatever happened to what was it, 3,000 foot distance for noise? Mm -hmm. That was part of an earlier version that the planning committee reviewed back in May. So it's gone? We posted it for public comment. There was um, considerable concern both from uh, regional energy advocates, um, the Cape Light Compact, uh, several other public comments were uh, concerned about the 3,000 foot setback. So we, as staff, reconsidered that, took it back to the planning committee and removed it from the, the proposed standard. Okay, what is the status on municipal facilities? Are they still coming in front of the commission? Uh, municipal facilities are not coming in front They're of the exempt commission. Then still. There, there is no threshold that would capture municipal facilities. Um, and there's no intention to put forth a threshold that would capture municipal facilities. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Mr. Rui. Oh, excuse me. Roger. Excuse me, Roger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, uh, E1, oh, in E19, I suggest that you add neighboring uses and residential areas. It's a little bit unclear as to what that sentence actually means. Impacts to neighboring and adjacent residential uses. Mm -hmm. and I would suggest the wording be neighboring uses or adjacent residential areas. I think that what we were trying to capture there is that um, impacts with shadow flicker would be felt on uh, structures for human habitation and not necessarily um, any neighboring use, but specifically residential uses. Well, so you want neighboring areas or adjacent residential uses, that's all. Okay, we can add that if. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other questions or comments from commission members? Yes, John. Uh, this deferral of the 3,000 feet, is that being returned to us to reduce the amount? I've forgotten what the, uh, what the reasons were. Uh, currently, the, I believe that the concern over the 3,000 foot setback, um, while proposed as a rebuttable presumption, the concern was that it was it would be it would prohibit wind development that that no one would be able to meet the standard. Yes, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, just to color that in a little bit, I, I think there was um, people are nervous about the inclusion of any number, um, even though in, in application the 3,000 foot uh, limit created a rebuttable presumption so that you would only be required to produce a, no a noise study if you were within 3,000 feet. Uh, so we've removed it, which in a sense now says you have to produce a noise study on every one you put up. <laughs> so you've actually increased the burden on potential developers, um, but that's how uh, skittish people were about the, the 3,000 foot limit. Um, so uh, we were uh, responsive to their concerns because in, in essence, by removing the 3,000 feet, there's actually more of a burden, not less of a burden, uh, than there was initially. So we, we didn't necessarily have a problem with that. I would just point out that these are uh, standards that you're reviewing today. So these are standards that will be applied to uh, wind energy facilities that uh, are trip some other DRI threshold or are discretionarily referred to the Cape Cod Commission. So there is no threshold trigger that's going to bring these projects in on their own. Um, but it does give us standards to review projects by if they trip another uh, trigger. Or more importantly, what it does is it gives the option to the towns now if they want the commission review to discretionally refer those projects up here. But it makes uh, really no individual project on its own a mandatory consideration. 
uh, of the commission. And the data as it relates to sort of wind is evolving. So when we get to issues of noise and, and distances from residential development, I expect over the next uh, five years or so that we'll have more reliable data on that and that people will get more comfortable with uh, numbers that will make it easier and more predictable. Um, but at this point, I, we're satisfied to get these uh, suggested standards on the books. Um, but I think, I think this is sort of Elizabeth's point earlier. I, I would envision this as step one. And as the discussion evolves, maybe there'll be uh, more s discussion about thresholds and standards. And certainly our work on the ocean DCPC is going to provide a lot of technical information that ultimately may find its way back to the commission as we try to unify our approach to wind energy generation uh, on land and offshore. Yes, please. Joanne. Hi, Ryan. I needed some clarification. On this document that we have called Energy, mm -hmm. if we go to um, E18 Noise, having uh, being a member of the planning committee mm -hmm. um, is the red just help me out here is the red what is we are going to adopt and vote on that's a great question I'm glad you brought that up there's a little confusion um, Thank you in the documents that are before you um, the planning committee's comments are reflected in a single sheet that I believe you all received as well that says minimum performance standards. It has planning committee um, edits and the date at the top. That is the language that will then fill in to the format uh, of the ordinance. So I used the ordinance to really walk you through the, the technical um, non-substantive changes at the front of the document but the, the back of the document with the performance standards does not yet re reflect the planning committee edits. So, I, follow up, but Mr. They will. Chairman? Because I thought the discussion was, and maybe I'm still on the wrong page here, but I thought that um, the applicant for the WEC is equal or greater than one shall provide a noise study to be verified by a consultant hired by the Cape Cod Commission but paid for the applicant. Mm -hmm. So is that in the right language, in the right place, and I'm on the wrong page? Uh, it's, it's the right language um, on this single sheet that says Planning Committee Edits. It hasn't made it into this format, but it will. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's I, the placeholder for that revised language that the Planning Committee uh, approved on Monday. Right. Thank you. Yes. Do we have any other questions, comments? I had a I had an observation. I just wondered what you the committee thought of it. The enormous amount of written testimony, and uh, I was wondering how they weighed the impact of some of that. Um, the the testimony that came in was received by the commission members in their packets. It wasn't received by the commission and available for distribution in time for the planning committee meeting. A lot of that came in at the end of, very end of last week, but we felt that it was important to put it before you um, and let you see the full public record and, and a lot of the comments that, that people had submitted. Um, so the, the planning committee was not able to discuss the, the complete public record uh, as it wasn't yet before them, as it is before you today. So. I guess my next question is the planning committee, after having considered all of the testimony, came up with the recommendations they're making. Uh, yes, these are part of a, uh, these standards have been uh, in discussion for the past several months mm -hmm. and no, um, uh, the, it was, they weren't revised considerably at the planning committee meeting. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Mr. Harris. Mr. Mm -hmm. Careful here. Uh, like the chair, I read extremely fast, but I was able to catch a lot of the, the substance and also. Do you want to put your microphone a little closer to you, please? Oh, you want to hear me? Huh? Uh, like the chair, I uh, I surveyed these documents and read them. A rapid rate, uh, but looking for the substance of what was being raised in them, uh, and particularly the complaints. And one of the things that seems to come out uh, throughout this, this, uh, these documents 
is that uh, some of the technical information we have about wind turbines and particularly the blades doesn't seem to have been captured and my question is because I know it's pretty hard to write a, a policy or a rule that covers everything you know it's called a roofers document but one of the things that I'm wondering here is whether or not uh, this in E1.7 which is in fact referring to safety mm -hmm. that it will also be pulled into noise because there are some some rather thorough scientific data, in fact one done by UMass back three years ago, that says that uh, the noise from these blades go much further than uh, one may think. <coughs> and so my question is, do you think that uh, this nuisance claims will cover all of these, these uh, particular complaints, issues that will be raised uh, sort of in a coverall situation? I think with these standards on the books, we'll be in a better position for the projects that we do review to um, help bring some clarity and transparency and understanding to noise setbacks. Um, requiring a noise study and verification of that noise study, again, just for the projects that we review, um, I, I think can only help that situation. Well, the reason why I asked the question is because there, there was one uh, person, I think it was in, in Falmouth, was saying that you know a couple hundred feet away and you can hear things and I just wonder how difficult it would be for us uh, for the staff and everyone who's involved to actually adjudicate these these issues mm -hmm. and uh, will there be some sort of a standard because uh, if everyone can bring in a nuisance complaint about this uh, I think someone mentioned earlier that it'd be rather difficult to mm -hmm. to actually raise a, a turbine and uh, because I know some people who are pretty good at nuisance uh, complaints. <laughs> I, know to, I know how to do that. And uh, so I'm, I'm just curious whether or not the, there's been some serious thought, you know, going through different scenarios to see if, in fact, you get yourself in a, a complaint a, a loop like this. Because uh, I consider that the, the citizens uh, have every right to raise an issue, but it's got to be something that's valid, some substance. But also, uh, look like we may not ever get out of the loop because of the fact that uh, one person will come in and says 300 feet away and they can come up with all of the scientific information and it's not a nuisance it's really a fact but you know, someone will say that's unreasonable to you should be able to to have a thing sitting back uh, 2,000 feet or 3,000 feet so I'm just wondering how, how much uh, you'd actually discuss this and whether or not you really feel comfortable uh, when my colleagues all sit around and try to resolve uh, issues like this because we're not writing the laws. What we're doing is, in fact, uh, uh, reviewing the policy and being sure that it fits within uh, the confines or the parameters of what has been laid out here. Well, I think you make a great point. The policy is necessarily loose because there's, uh, it's really tricky to wave through the information that is out there currently about wind. What, we, what our next step with this process would be, once the standards are set, we can then be directed as staff to develop the technical bulletin. And the technical bulletin can serve as um, sort of best development practices and guidance for how to conduct a noise study. We can pull in uh, a consultant that has expertise in noise issues and acoustical issues that can help us write those guidelines. And I think that way, having that document in place, um, which will come before, I believe, the planning committee, um, Having that document in place will help you make sense of the noise studies that you have to sort through in the future when you're reviewing projects. Oh. Yeah, just to follow that up, because it's a very good question, but it, this is really a starting point in a field that uh, where information is evolving and technology is changing all the time. So I think we want to leave the standards um, vague enough uh, especially with the high degree of confidence that I have in this board and its subcommittee's uh, use of its discretion in other matters, uh, to provide an opportunity for everybody to be heard and for somebody to sort of uh, make some objective decisions about how to, how to move forward with these projects. Uh, the technical bulletin, I think, will be the way that we can uh, more quickly update any information that we have, but ultimately, in the big picture, whether it's the ocean DCPC, offshore, or land-based, I think if you look at our experience with uh, sizable offshore commercial 
uh, wind energy generation and you look at our land-based experience in towns like Orleans and Wellfleet and Norwich and Brewster and Falmouth, um, I believe the, the, the fastest way to, to get renewables going and to generate wind power is in a regulated environment where everybody understands the rules up front. I don't think, you know, putting these structures up um, in an unregulated environment leads to a, an expedited outcome in any way, sh way, shape, or form. And so I hope that that's where we can go with this, because the Commission uh, wants to promote renewable energy. We certainly don't want to be an impediment to the use of uh, a wind as a renewable energy. But there are other ways to go about it. One of them would be a comprehensive planning strategy where we looked at all the available space on the Cape and tried to find areas uh, consistent with our approach on the regional policy plan where we might want to pre-permit um, the construction of these facilities uh, with no regulation. Uh, so that these are all sort of on the table as this is evolving. Um, and it's a difficult thing to do. But with it, although it may sound counterintuitive to some, I honestly believe that a regulated environment where everybody knows specific f numbers of feet and uh, there are specifics associated with it is the fastest way to have these projects move forward. And I think we, we have standards that we can vote on today. We also have some projects that we're going to review uh, soon that are going to give us more um, exposure and information going forward. So, so uh, I believe you will exercise your discretion wisely and that we will fill in the blanks as we move along. Any other commission questions or comments? Yes. Roger. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, at the risk of flying in the face of conventional wisdom, I don't believe that we are getting enough information here in order to make an intelligent uh, judgment as to whether what is proposed here will achieve whatever it's supposed to achieve. I'm therefore going to vote against this, uh, not because I am opposed to the thought behind it, but because I do not feel this has been sufficiently fleshed out to make an intelligent judgment. All right, thank you. Any other commission comment? Seeing none. Oh, excuse me, Joy. <coughs> The, the planning committee approved these um, noise safety and flicker um, minimum performance standards because we knew that technology was changing and that um, we would learn, be learning essentially by the seat of our pants because they are just these projects are just coming to us now. It's like a regular policy. A policy is a general statement and the regulations are the flesh and the muscle that you apply to the skeleton. And um, I have no problem with this. I think because of the wording this, studies have to be done either by, by the commission and by the applicant's consultants um, will protect us. And I read all of the information that came and I learned a lot and I, I felt that I I am more educated to the problems that might occur and that I will be more educated in the questions that I ask um, when these projects come before us and if I'm on a subcommittee. But um, I feel very confident that um, those three minimum performance standards are the very first step and that we will be expanding on those in time. But at least it, it gives us something to act by to act accordingly to um, when the new projects come to us. John? Yes, um, I certainly understand what Roger is, is raising and um, I don't make the decisions uh, to decide what I'm going to do prior to the whole process is completed, but I was certainly leaning away from it. Uh, so I have a question to you and that is, Will this technical bulletin be in place prior to us trying to do something with this this document? Uh, typically the process is that the standards are adopted here and then at the assembly um, and we begin drafting the technical bulletin once the standards are in place. So we're not going to review anything until we have a technical bulletin? Uh, you, do you mean a project, a potential yeah. wind project? Yeah. It's, it is not likely that we would be applying the standards to a project before 
before we had time to finish the technical building. Mm -hmm. There may be a project that comes through, but there's a, if it's a project whose application has already been deemed complete before the standards come forward, the standards won't be applied to that project. So, and I don't foresee any other projects on the horizon, uh, so we'll have time to complete that technical bulletin before we use any of these standards. Mm -hmm. the, if I may, um, the pieces to inform the technical bulletin uh, and the research that staff has done over the past eight months, um, the technical bulletin should come together rather quickly. Yeah. And, and I, I, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, just want to impress upon the commission that I think what the standards here today do is really help us help towns that might have projects that land in their town. They may not have the staff resources to adequately review that or conduct a public process, and now they would be able to ask us uh, to step in and apply the standards that we have and conduct that on their behalf. And I, I see that as the most useful aspect of the regulations, uh, the standards that are before the commission today. Yes, Peter. Yes, uh, yeah, I understand Roger's uh, uh, bit of trepidation. And all due respect though, I think uh, baked in these uh, minimum performance standards are safety devices. I went through this uh, mound of literature uh, and I didn't read verbatim, but there was a um, great, uh, everybody was coming at it at, from different angles. Some of the studies had merit, some didn't have merit. Uh, you couldn't sort out really who was the authority and who had authority. I thought somebody like uh, the one from uh, the University of California, Davis might be a good one. However, I found it weak. So I think there's a whole raft of things. I think the safety net is that we have uh, the ability. We are not, I don't think, going to be experts in wind uh, crafting wind legislation. We have, uh, you know, baked in there a consultant hired who's probably sifted through most of this and can guide us through and, you know, come up with an objective rather than a bias because a lot of these reports were biased. Mm -hmm. They're biased by people that, you know, are suffering from wind noise or fear of, of uh, blades flying off turbines or things like that. So, you know, a lot, it's good information. I learned a lot with it. However, some of these studies I just question, uh, take drawing any conclusions from. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, what we have, and we reviewed it in the committee, and I think it's a good start and a good place to go in order for us to get up in the curve of learning about, you know, legislation and how to do what we're going to do with these wind uh, facilities. So, thank you. I think from my point of view that th this is a process and the planning uh, committee is part of that process and uh, I have confidence in the people who are on that committee uh, to be able to solicit input and be able to evaluate that input and then the process comes to another level where it is right now. And we have the same obligation that the, per, the uh, planning committee uh, has had. We will get information and it's up to us to evaluate and move on, as will the assembly of delegates. So, I mean, it's not like uh, anybody's being ignored. Everybody who says something is being evaluated and we have people in place who are capable of doing that, I think, quite well. You know, commission members, staff, so on and so forth. Anyway. Thank you. I'd be derelict. I too serve on the planning committee, and I think that I would be derelict if I didn't address Roger's questions. Um, but we did meet for quite a long time, and um, as you heard, there's more and more possible applications for wind farms uh, or wind turbines. So when you look at minimum performance standards, just looking at safety, noise, and shadow flicker, we had a lengthy discussion and we added where we thought in the dialogue that there should be other protections for, um, for going forward with any project. And also the staff gave us on this one sheet of paper, Ryan, that I finally found, thank you, mm -hmm. is that um, you also have some, you know, definitions 
for the terminology, which we will probably be more in, much more about over the, the next few years. So I think that just as my fellow members said, you have to begin somewhere, and um, and it's something on paper. And I would recommend that our colleagues vote and um, support the planning committee and the work that we did last Monday. Thank you. All right. We have to go to the next deck of our process, and that's public comment. And uh, so we would be happy to have public comment. Just come forward and address yourself, identify yourself. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Richard Elric. I'm the energy coordinator for the towns of uh, Bourne and Barnstable. And I wanted to just make a sort of an opening observation of, and attempt to put this whole discussion in context. It is the uh, policy of the federal government, of the state government, and many of our local communities to expand the amount of renewable energy generation that's being produced. And we're doing it for very, very specific reasons. Uh, whether uh, the issue is climate change, uh, a reduction of relying on fossil fuels, energy independence to reduce the volatility of uh, the cost of electricity from fossil fuels, every single argument leads us to believe that we have an obligation uh, and a need from so many perspectives to move to the generation of electricity that is sustainable from renewable energy sources. So everything that we should be doing, it seems to me, ought to be to expedite the process of developing renewable energy, not making it more difficult. Having said that, uh, I did want to comment just a little bit on some of the specifics uh, in the proposed changes. Um, first of all, with, with respect to noise, just another quick observation. Uh, it is getting again, more and more challenging to site uh, wind turbines. Uh, we've had, as everyone is well aware, a great deal of resistance to siting them offshore where we can see them. We now apparently have the entire Old Kings Highway Historic District uh, that apparently is off limits to the siting of wind turbines, or it would seem that way. And, uh, and now more recently, we have some people suggesting that we ought to have uh, 3,000 plus foot buffers around the turbines. Uh, I think as has already been pointed out, if we were to do that in light of the other uh, uh, challenges of siting wind turbines, we wouldn't be able to cite a single turbine on Cape Cod. And I think it's one thing to talk about how we all support renewable energy, but it's an entirely different thing to do the kinds of things and to promote the kinds of regulations that actually make that more likely to happen rather than less likely to happen, uh, particularly with respect to a specific perimeter around a turbine. The problem with that kind of a, a determination in advance is that every turbine is different. Every location for every turbine is different. The topography makes all of, uh, all of the difference in terms of what kind of noise uh, can be heard from, uh, from abutters. Some larger turbines actually produce less sound and noise than smaller turbines. So it is not so easily uh, remedied to simply say that we need to have a, a buffer of 1,000 or 2,000 feet around a particular turbine. It is a much more complicated process. And again, if we're going to actually cite some turbines rather than just talk about it, we've got to take that into consideration. With respect to the specific language of uh, the noise uh, component here, uh, it says that uh, uh, all applicants for a WECFs equal to or greater than one megawatt shall provide a noise study to be verified by a consultant hired by Cape Cod Commission, and I'm reading the old language, and the, and the language that is of concern to me is to adequately mitigate adverse noise impacts. I think that is uh, quite vague uh, and going to be very difficult, even though I know you're going to be preparing regulations. I think it's, it's uh, unnecessarily uh, vague and ambiguous and will potentially create some problems down the line when people really want to figure out what is it I have to do uh, to meet noise standards. As many of you are aware, uh, DEP uh, requires, uh, as part of its uh, noise uh, policies with respect to wind turbines, that the noise created by a wind turbine not exceed 10 decibels uh, at the boundary of its property line. To me, that's a more reasonable approach. It's something that's quantifiable. It's something that somebody can uh, determine uh, rather easily with a consultant or or, or not. Uh, and so I would uh, suggest that that kind of language, being specific about what 
amount of sound is, is appropriate in any given uh, circumstance would be easier for prospective developers. Uh, and then on to uh, shadow flicker. Um, your language reads, all WECFs equal to or greater than one megawatt shall demonstrate there are no adverse flicker impacts. I would urge that the word significant be uh, placed in after no. Uh, and I will cite, uh, if, I, if I may, the language from Barnstable's wind ordinance uh, with respect to shadowing and flicker. Uh, quote, wind energy conversion facilities shall be cited in a manner that does not result in significant shadowing or flicker impacts. The proponent has the burden of proving that this effect does not have a significant adverse impact on the neighboring or adjacent uses, either through siting or mitigation. And the reason that I have great trepidation about the, uh, the, the rather um, limiting language of no adverse shadow flicker is there are a number of circumstances that I can think of and that I've actually experienced with other wind turbine projects where, for example, there might be some shadow uh, early in the morning for a short period of time at the back of a residence away from the bedrooms, for example. So that in effect, while there is a, sh a, a shadow impact to that residence, it's not significant, doesn't in any way have a negative impact on that residence. Um, and so when you use language that is so clearly uh, pejorative in a sense to say no adverse shadow flicker, I think you're unduly limiting what is possible. And so I would urge you to consider adding the word significant. Uh, again, a lot of this is, is, is always going to be somewhat open to, to debate and, uh, uh, and to discussion as to what these words mean, but the clearer that you can make it and the more uh, willing you are to look at language that enhances the possibility of wind turbine uh, generation, uh, turbine projects and, and uh, the electricity ger generated from them, I think you will be meeting the goals of the towns and certainly the state and, and, and the feds as we move forward to try to figure out how do we develop, develop a sustainable energy future. And we're not gonna get there if we make it harder and more challenging for renewable energy projects. And I will leave, it, leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please identify yourself. Hi there, Liz Argo with the Capen Island Wind Information Network. And that would be the first piece of business I would offer up the uh, commissioners. That uh, the website, which is www.ciwin.org, has been created to help sort through the uh, amazing amounts of material that we have, both supportive and uh, anti-wind. And what we've done on the website is um, eliminated anything that is not uh, pure of wind association, wind development associations. Uh, so it has to be government studies uh, or institutions that are clearly um, not associated with any wind development. Uh, we've also, as part of uh, the service that we've provided, gone and videotaped at the surrounding areas in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, both turbines at Portsmouth, Rhode Island, both turbines in Hull, um, the Mass Maritime Academy, we're, we're not allowed to tape it, the military uh, turbine. But the interviews that we solicited just by knocking on doors are posted, and we have found one complaint, for instance, and we are happy to be able to provide that. Um, we are not yet allowed access to Falmouth and the neighborhood, but we're looking forward to being able to help uh, understand what has happened there. Uh, this, the studies that we have done and trying to, de to determine what has happened in Falmouth and possibly in Vinyl Haven and Mars Hill where we're getting the uh, complaints. Uh, we do st are starting to look at specific reasons and we're uh, looking forward to the studies which should be forthcoming very soon from Vinyl Haven and from Falmouth that will help this board understand that there were specific issues with those turbines and um, we're, we're happy to help with the uh, development of the technical bulletin so that, that uh, the, the, the standards that you're trying to create can be developed from those studies. So thank you very much. A question, a question, if I might. Yes, sir. <clears throat> did you uh, come to any of the planning meetings where this was being discussed? Yes, I did. Good. Thank you. Please identify yourself. I will indeed. <laughs> My name is John Lippman, uh, Lippman Development Strategies, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. I don't have a lot to add, just one or two things that I want to point out to what's already been said. Um, uh, 
should a restriction be uh, forthcoming from the commission, um, a, uh, a regulation in this matter, it seems that it ought to follow what uh, some of the towns, or at least the best towns, have done in terms of putting forth their own regulations. Um, in the town of Bourne, which has a very extensive, very well thought out uh, uh, bylaw for wind generation, the uh, the uh, requirements are that the distance between the base of a wind turbine and uh, the nearest residential structure should be uh, actually 1.0, the, the height of the turbine plus 10 feet. So it's not a 1.5. Um, and I would very much um, encourage you to, to look at some of those other examples. Um, should the commission decide that a greater distance sort of as a baseline or as a starting point is required, then I, I do think that, and I'm glad to see uh, some provision for reducing uh, that distance. However, I am concerned that um, the reducing the setback as a matter of negotiation with an abutting property owner is a very loose standard that seems to me to be not objective and, and not necessarily um, in, in the uh, appropriate regulatory role that the Commission uh, offers to the rest of the Cape. It seems, for example, it's, it's somewhat of a devolution of that regulatory authority. In fact, the it seems that such a reduction should actually be uh, based upon um, something more um, objective, such as, as you, you've actually said there, no threat to life or property, or uh, a, you know, no uh, significant impacts to a uh, number of different uh, 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 elements of, of life for a neighboring property owner. So, so that, that I wanted to point out. I do think that that needs changing. Um, it, this really should not be a sort of a negotiation among private parties. It really should be the commission stepping in to regulate. It seems that that um, there should be objective ways in which that regulation can be applied and can also be made more flexible. Um, so um, I think that really is, uh, you know, are, are the, the main things I wanted to point out. I did also want to point out that, yes, again, the state um, has uh, very well thought out standards that uh, it's a, 10, a plus 10 decibel rule for, um, uh, for noise. And, uh, and in addition, I would, I would agree with um, uh, Dick Elric's uh, uh, contribution that uh, the idea that there should not be significant impacts and again that I, I think that that's more reasonable word more commonly used in legislation both the local regional and state level so um, we uh, obviously we would like to see what is in the technical bulletin we look forward to seeing that and uh, I would certainly offer uh, any service that I can provide in helping provide input to that as it is developed thank you thank you very much are there any other members in the public that would like to comment? Seeing none, yes. Uh, just to <clears throat> follow up on a couple things, and Jessica's gonna jump in if I get out of line here, but uh, some of the, the semantics about whether it should be no adverse impacts or no significant adverse impacts, I would agree it could either be no significant impacts or no adverse impacts. The determination is whether a project is, is impacted, impacted adversely is akin to a determination as to whether that impact is significant. So I don't, I don't necessarily recognize the difference there. To have significant adverse impact would imply that yeah, you could have some degree of adverse impact. Um, so I'm not sure that that's, that's where we want to go uh, on the language there. I just want to correct, as I said earlier, that there was, there's been no suggestion by the commission that there be a 3,000 foot buffer around wind turbines. That that was indeed a rebuttable presumption for the production of a noise study, and that we've removed that um, based on, on uh, suggestions from number of people that are, are nervous about that number being misinterpreted as being more than a rebuttable presumption, and we're okay with that. Um, but the result of removing the 3,000 feet has actually increased the burden on, on developers, I think, therefore, ironically, making it more difficult to site uh, some of these wind turbines. Uh, so that's uh, where we, we have been to date on the changes. And as it relates to the negotiation uh, that abutters have, I think that comes from a particular instance of a project that's being planned now where the developer has purchased an easement from an abutting property in order to be able to go forward with the development. What we didn't want to do was to have a hard, fast number um, 
that would say even if even if you had an agreement with an abutter for an easement on their property that was in the fall zone, you couldn't do it. So I think it actually has the the opposite impact of making it easier to site by allowing those kinds of uh, negotiated easements to be part of a development plan and not being hard and fast. So those are the three points I wanted to make in answer to that. Anything, Councillor? I, I think you covered everything. Um, and the planning committee, you may recall, Jessica Wilgus for the record, um, Commission Council, um, the planning committee did address the same issue came up before the planning committee um, as to um, the modifier to um, no shadow flicker in um, MPS 3. And the planning committee um, felt that uh, if it had just said no shadow flicker, then that would be completely precluding um, wind development. But where the modifier adverse is in that standard, it provides that protection and that uh, objective role for the commission to play in making that determination. Um, as it relates to um, MPS 1 and the discussion about um, whether it poses a threat to life or property, um, that language was put in there um, to project, to basically maintain the objective obligation that the commission has with respect to um, public safety concerns um, and also to uh, reserving individual rights, property holders' rights, uh, as it relates to tort and nuisance claims. Those, ex those are rights that exist uh, as of law, and that's not something that uh, we could, within a standard, have them waive or right away. So we wanted to be clear when someone reads this standard that they know that those still exist, um, but we're not writing that into our process. That already exists. That's, some, that's a right they have at law. They can go to court if they need to on that issue, um, but that's not part of the review. It just needs to be in there up front so people um, know where they're coming from. Um, and Ryan, do you want to speak to the 1.5? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for the record, Ryan Christenberry. Um, the 1.5 times the tip height for the setback um, is seen as a, an industry standard, a conservative industry standard, but an industry standard. Um, a lot of the local bylaws on the Cape include a tip height setback of 1.1, and that uh, directly uh, comes from the model bylaw that the Commission worked with the Cape Light Compact several years ago to develop. And since that time, the wind turbines that we're seeing for land-based operation have gotten bigger, they've gotten larger, um, so some of the, the safety standards and concerns have gotten a little more conservative. So that's the rationale behind the one and a half times the tip height. And I'd also just like to note that the mass DEP noise regulation um, that is often applied to wind turbine projects wasn't written for wind development. It's been in existence for quite some time. It's simply a noise regulation. It doesn't um, cite wind. And there are certainly examples of projects that have complied with the mass DEP noise regulation um, um, that uh, there's at least the perception that there are um, significant impacts with, with respect to noise. Uh, just a little comment or an observation that this uh, mitigating adverse noise impacts is not the only condition available through our recommendations or standards that people or developers or whoever who are in, you know, building wind turbines and that sort of business, there are other standards they have to meet. And would, is it your professional opinion that those standards as they've been proposed by the uh, planning committee, you know, adequately address, you know, I mean, we have reason to be comfortable with them? Are you referring to the list of existing minimum performance standards yes, in the RPP that, that might possibly be applied? Um, uh, in some respects, they, they may be. I mean, there's standards that deal with open space clearing. Um, there's standards that deal with um, the amount of hazardous materials you can have on a site in a water recharge area. Those certainly could be applied to wind projects in the right 
uh, setting, um, but they don't deal with the issues that most often surface with noise and bring about the greatest amount of controversy and confusion over what the impacts may be, which are typically safety, noise, and shadows. So that's why we propose just well, those three here. I was saying that, yeah, that everybody doesn't get everything they want all at the same time, but there's a general overall pattern you know, then if you apply all the components, then we're pretty well off. Is that, would you say that? I, I think that having these standards can only help um, bring some transparency to the process. Thank you yeah. very much. Sure. Any other comments from? Uh, we can discuss this more in to energy section, uh, I move to close the hearing and the record. Second. Moved and seconded that the hearing and the record be closed on this matter. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Any abstentions? I do. Peter? I move that the Cape Cod Commission approve the proposed energy standards as amended and forward the standards to the Assembly of Delegates for adoption and incorporation into the Barnstable County Regional Policy Plan. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion, comments? Mr. Harris, into the microphone, please. I'll take your chair with me. <laughs> um, so can I, I will assume that all of these suggested changes, there are none. You know, add a word, subtract a word, there's nothing, it's just strictly what has been submitted to us, to the commissions, yeah? Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Any other comments? I guess it's the commission's ready to vote. All in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Abstentions? I heard one, one no, is that correct? Yes. Okay, it passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for a very wonderful presentation. Okay, next thing on our agenda is uh, the public hearing continued from August 5th regarding the regional policy plan proposed technical corrections to ordinances 10-07. Sharon Rooney? No, Jessica. Yes, I'm Jessica Wilgus, Commission Counsel. I'm here on Sharon's behalf. Uh, this um, technical corrections piece to the minimum performance standards is literally that. Uh, you would have seen in your packets a memo from Sharon to you dated July 28th, 2010, which uh, is listed as proposed technical corrections to ordinance 10-07-2010 annual amendment to 2009 RPP. Uh, if you had the opportunity to read through these, uh, these are literally Scrivener's errors, if you will. Uh, there are uh, four or five changes in here that are word changes. Um, I, uh, if you are so inclined, I can walk you through them, but um, I think they're all explanatory. Um, I'll take the chair's direction on how you'd like me to proceed on this. Or it, perhaps I can just open it up for just questions if anyone has right any questions about you, them. You want questions first? Are there any questions on this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do anybody have any had... questions? Would you, you like me, me to walk through? Surprise. I was walk through. waiting for the movie Sorry. first. If you have the copy in front of you, um, just for the members' uh, information, if you didn't have an opportunity to go through these, I'll, I'll go through them very quickly. Um, in that memo, um, under, um, it's referenced as page 63 of the RPP, 
um, under the regional land use vision map process. Um, it proposes to add to the sentence, towns may also modify their mapped areas and or it adds the language, proposed to adopt a land use vision map following the process outlined above. Um, so uh, it just indicates that the town will propose uh, a land use vision map, clarifies that language. That's good. Okay. Uh, the second change is on page 64 of the RPP and it is a change to the sentence that begins commission clerk will then submit an affidavit for recording that certifies the attached is a true copy of the plan approved by and it says the vote and it's changed the is stricken and the a uh, vote of the commission is put in here so that's Sharon's change <laughs> if you then turn to page 77 uh, WR 5.3 uh, the last sentence of that minimum performance standard, the term designated is stricken. So it's, it will read now read, in towns without a land use vision map, as opposed to in towns without a desig designated a land use vision map. So it clarifies that a town without a land use vision map, uh, this MPS would only apply to water quality improvement areas. <coughs> In WR 5.5, uh, it simply changes um, the last sentence to uh, move the word only, where it says this MPS shall only apply. It changes the modifier to say it shall apply only to impaired areas. And let's see, I think this is the last one. No, it is not. Page 94. Uh, in the subsection in the middle of the page where it says removal of SNR designation for the calculation of open space requirement, the first sentence says notwithstanding the foregoing, when an applicant can provide the following documentation required by subsections one, two, or three below, and there's an extraneous word in there that says apply, that, that word is stricken, so it doesn't belong there. On page 111 of the RPP, under E1.5, on-site renewable energy generation, uh, it moves the reference to kilowatt hours from its position after annual electrical demand to after the entire phrase annual electrical demand, which is, uh, makes more sense. And finally, yes, finally, on page 117, under uh, AH 3.2, which is the alternative mitigation calculation option. Uh, it modifies the language in the last sentence, uh, which references guidelines for mitigation credit and reduction for minimum performance standards, AH 3.2, and it references that as amended, because it's been amended. So that, those are all of the technical corrections. They are all literally technical corrections and we uh, ask that you uh, move to approve these so that we can forward them together with the just approved um, energy changes so that they can be forwarded to the assembly as a comprehensive document. Go ahead. Peter, please. RPP. And, excuse me, does anybody have any questions about those very wonderful changes? <laughs> okay. RPP technical corrections. I move to close the hearing and the record. Second. All in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's done. I move that the Cape Cod Commission approve the proposed technical corrections to the regional policy plan and forward the corrections to the Assembly of Delegates for adoption and incorporation into the Barnstable County Regional Policy Plan. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? None. I one more crack at the tree. Okay. A consolidated motion. I move that the Cape Cod Commission send the RPP technical corrections and the amendments to the energy section of the RPP to the Assembly of Delegates as a single ordinance for approval. Second. Is there any discussion regarding that? 
All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? It's done. Thank, right, you. thank you. The next item on the agenda is the Cape Wide Ocean Management Planning District of Critical Planning Concern Update. Hi, for the record, Heather McElroy, Natural Resources Planner. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief update on where where we've come on the Ocean Management Planning DCPC. Um, I know Paul gave a little overview in his executive director's report. I'll give a little bit more detail and an opportunity to answer any questions you might have on where we're at. Um, we did convene the policy committee um, initially on July 29th. We had representatives from 13 of the 15 towns present and uh, three neighboring RPAs represented as well, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Serped. Um, we gave that group an overview of what the DCPC was all about, um, going through the goals, interests, and guidelines. Um, we answered their questions about that. And we reviewed with them the members of the technical advisory work group that we've managed to bring together thus far. That's an ongoing process, trying to build that technical group so that we have the resources um, to help inform the process to the best um, we're able. Um, we also reviewed a flow chart of what, how we anticipate this process to move forward over the next 10 months. Um, concluding on May 10th is our deadline. Um, then we got into a discussion of um, some guiding principles, which we hope will inform and guide the, the process. Um, the principles are based on the DCPC guidelines, which were really the, the substantive meat of the, uh, the DCPC. Um, it's based on, the, those guiding principles are based on the guidelines, goals, interests, it, it sort of in plainer language puts out in 16 principles um, how we're going to proceed and, and uh, sort of the rules of play as it were. Um, we had a lot of good input from the committee on the guiding principles and um, we went away to revise them and, and return um, revisions to them two weeks later which was just last week, August 12th. Um, continued that discussion with them. Also discussed the task lists, which are the actual items that the technical advisory work group will address and put into a plan um, to present to the policy committee, we hope in by October. Uh, and we also took their comments on stakeholders that we should involve um, as the process moves forward, we want to engage a formal stakeholder group and um, share with them the work of the technical advisory group um, as it becomes available. So we agreed on a next meeting um, in October, hopefully when we have some draft work product to present. Um, and so that's the end of the sort of update on the policy committee end of it. Um, we also recently, as a staff, had a meeting with the Mass Ocean Partnership, which is a nonprofit that um, played a significant role in assisting the state's ocean management planning process um, and discussed with them opportunities for collaboration. And uh, I think that will really help us build our technical advisory work group. Um, also, they, will, they can provide a lot of resources to us. They um, have funded a lot of research, some of which may be very relevant and informative to the review process. Um, one of the components of the sort of the technical analysis on this is uh, visual assessments. And I've been trying to keep you updated on, on the policy committee meetings through emails. Um, and I think you also were aware of uh, our effort to take a public op opinion poll or preference study um, at some of the Cape beaches and, and shore locations. Um, that is to help inform this visual assessments um, process. And we've started those polls already. Um, commission staff have been out to, well, between yesterday and today, four locations. Um, and we're already getting a lot of feedback. Um, people are actually engaged in uh, 
interested in participating in, in this poll. So I think we have 100 or so responses out of two days, which is excellent. Um, we hope to be in at least five towns and hopefully seven. Um, we've also engaged a specialist from um, SUNY Syracuse, I believe, uh, who's been instrumental thus far in, in helping us hone our methodology for this visual assessments piece. We're also um, convening the technical work groups in the areas of natural resources and renewable energy development um, next week on the 24th and the 25th, respectively. Um, that's sort of the overview. I think that one last piece is just that um, there are, we've, Nancy's done a great job of setting up a website um, linked from our main site. It's capecodcommission.org slash ocean planning. The link should be right on the front page. Um, and we're trying to provide there all of the resources that um, have been shared with the policy committee, minutes, resources, et cetera. So if you have an urgent need to find an answer to a question, maybe you'll find it there. Um, but hopefully that will be a, a growing resource. And that's all I have unless you have any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, John. Will the uh, visual assessment just be um, to the seven or so towns or shooting to get all of them? So the, um, this visual assessment is um, a component of, of a larger analysis um, that we'll do. Um, the, our consultant, Rick Smarden, has helped lay out a methodology which has several different components. Um, one of the, the, the first really is um, identifying the CAPE into very broad land use categories. And um, then a, taking, uh, I'm not explaining this well, um, simplifying the, the Cape landscape into some very broad areas like beaches, salt marshes, um, woodlands, built areas. And then based on information that we're going to gather from these, these this initial polling activity that we're doing at these seven locations, we can then translate that information to some of these other, you know, to generalize it. Um, there, we also hope to um, do a broader uh, survey effort that um, might be web-based, might be a mailing, it depends on funding to some extent, um, that would gather information um, from a broader public that uh, would have statistical validity. Um, this one is, the one that we're doing at the moment um, is informative, but it isn't, it isn't in intended to be the entire picture. The, excuse me, Mary. I just wanted to add to that question. Sure. Uh, if, if I could, we, the survey part of this is extraordinarily important. So the visual assessment survey that's going on now is only a piece of what will be hopefully a series of scientifically significant, statistically significant scientific surveys that we can all knit together. The, uh, what happened is the landscape, we went through the landscape classification piece up front, and then from that we came up with a representative sample Cape-wide. There are, of course, a few communities that wouldn't allow us to conduct the survey at their beaches without select, Board of Selectmen approval, uh, which pushes us beyond uh, the useful life of the survey, uh, but we're dealing with it. Other comments or questions? Seeing none. Do we have any Cape Cod Commission member comments? I yeah. would like Sorry. to say, excuse me, go ahead. Did you have one? I just wanted to make a comment, if I may. Uh, as commissioners, we're all, we're all aware of that 900-pound elephant in the room, which is wastewater. We should also be aware, and I'm sure we all are, of the 900 pound elephant in the waiting area and that's stormwater. And we might, uh, I don't know whether it's possible to address them under one heading, whether there should be a central authority or, but uh, just something for consideration. Thank you. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, Jack's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and, uh, and we've had some initial discussions about um, some of the new EPA regulations as they relate to stormwater enforcement, which is going to put an incredible unfunded mandate on municipalities and how we might set up a stormwater utility. So as the wastewater discussion evolves to talk about how um, there might be regional assistance in dealing with the fi finances of wastewater, I agree that I think we should take a look at including stormwater and stormwater utilities as part of that discussion. And before we adjourn, I just would like to mention that prior to this meeting, and it happens at other meetings too, but five uh, members of the commission were involved in a meeting for somewhere near three hours and rushed over here, and here they all are. So I think they'd be congratulated for their public service and what a wonderful thing it means for our region. I would accept a motion to adjourn. Yep. Yes. Are you giving special credit to some people who work five hours? <laughs> would you say that again in the microphone? Yeah, are you giving <laughs> special credit to some of our members who have worked five hours? Can you arrange that? No, because I, I mean, I worked uh, six hours yesterday. <laughs> okay. No special favors here. Okay. That's what we would, here. would you like to move? No, uh, yeah. I'd adjourn? like to move that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify for saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Adjourn. Thank you.